uh, let's uh, uh, kick this off. Welcome, everybody. It's nine o'clock. Uh, welcome to this, uh, the second uh, time we have this 5G technical webinar, um, the 2021 version then. It's been uh, last year we had a, uh, a, a, um, a, first, a first session with uh, four interesting talks and we, uh, we follow up on that <clears throat> with some um, uh, presentations of uh, technical work and, and innovations that have been, uh, uh, well, taken, 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 taken uh, forward and, and developed here in the, uh, in the in the around the, the Gulf of um, of uh, Bosnia, um, we have four presentations. Uh, we have a presentation from Oulu, two presentations from Lulio, and or from the University uh, Lulio University of Technology, and we have one from Ericsson, also on the Swedish side. Um, we are, uh, I think, most of the of the people who uh, who announced to be here are here so welcome again um we will have we will, after two sessions or two presentations i plan to have a short a short break uh that will be in in roughly an, 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 an short, less than an hour uh to stretch our legs and we come back within a few minutes to have the second uh, the second part the second half of this of this um, webinar so uh, with that, we have we I, I want to add that we will try to the extent that all the presenters uh, allow this. We will share later on the uh, the uh, the slides of this event and potentially also the uh, the recorded presentations uh, uh, and and we will send out the the links to those um, after the, this uh, later on. So with that. Uh, I welcome all, all again, and we give the word to the first presenters uh, and the uh, presenter, and that is uh, Harry uh, Sarnisari from from uh, Oulu University. So, um, Harry, go ahead. I will unshare my <coughs> my screen here. Let's see. There you go, and you should be able to share them. Okay, good morning, everybody. So my name is Harri Sarnisari, and I come from Central for Wireless Communication University of Oulu. And this work is, uh, or this presentation is part of Project Arctic, Arctic 5G Test Networks. And it is co-funded by Interreg Nord, Lapin Liitto and Region Norrbotten. And also I'm working for 6G flagship. That's why I'm using these slides backgrounds. And what I will talk today is about results from remote area connectivity solutions and then a small discussion about some use cases what we have in this project. So why why we did this so one one part of the project was a questionnaire about the what consequences connectivity problems cause to people's usual daily life and work in remote areas but in order to do that in fruitful way we should also know how we can solve some of the problems using existing technology so like to identify what what are those solutions what we can use how well they perform are they really helpful and and so on and in the project we already released a leaflet about these techniques but we really don't didn't know how they work but here in the in the figure you can see see the technique. So it's the external modem with Wi-Fi in it, and this modem could also be attached with the external antennas to improve the situation. And then we have this kind of semi-mobile or on-the-move system inductive adapter, and we also tested that because that 
uh, that kind of easily mobile system could be used when you are in the wilderness areas. You can carry that with you. So we did some, uh, some measurements around Oulu, but not in the city of Oulu. Uh, one purpose was to test our 5G test network here in Oulu, but unfortunately the measurement systems what we have for that was not cooperative with our modems, so we, can, we were not able to do those. That's why we are restricted to 4G results. And in the city, we tried to first do measurements in the, uh, around, around university campus, campus in bad areas, but we had some problems there because in actual life, you can, in the city, you can see several LTE bands and then you cannot be sure where the mobile is. It jumps between the frequency bands quite crazily. And that is not good for our measurements. Of course, if you would have a dedicated test devices, then you can fix the band and technology. But that is not real life situation. It's not what the ordinary people will see. So for that reason, we went to areas where they have only one frequency band available in LTE, just drive. 10 to 15 kilometers from outside of the city center. And this inductive platform is it in this figure below. Uh, it's quite small, it's smaller than mobile, mobile phone, easy to carry. But with that, you have to carry the directional antenna, either this log periodic antenna, what is in this figure or something similar. And that, that of course limits your mobility if you have over one meter antenna with you, you cannot put that everywhere. But we use this, is it, was it 13 DPI direction, log periodic antenna, and then three different mobile phones in, in the measurement campaigns. And we were along the roads and uh, in the cottages. Uh, uh, this cottage beside this lake, it's down, down and behind the hill, or, uh, there's no direct connectivity to the base station there. So it was a good place to do measurements. <clears throat> a typical place where people have problems. Uh, there are, <coughs> here are results of this inductive platform things, and we use this uh, para uh, or metrics, which are typically used in LTE to set to see the quality of the system. And you can see the results for these three phones about uh, received signal strength, RSRP, uh, reference symbols power, uh, reference symbols RQ value and signal to noise ratio value. And these are without adapter, with adapter, and then with antenna raised to the 3.5 meters. And if you look at these, these, these numbers, you can see that they are a bit confusing. Sometimes they, with some metric, they show improvement with some metrics, they do not show improvement. Then it is phone dependent. In some phones, it shows improvements and in some phones did not show improvements. And then in the right hand side, we did also some speed dead tests there. And there are even even more confusion. So this device one was the worst phone what we had, and it was not very sensitive. And this, <clears throat> these uh, metric values were very poor for that. But on the other hand, we saw <clears throat> clear Im improvement in, uh, in download speed with that device. And then this device two, two showed good results with the metrics, 
but bad results with the download speeds and that that is a bit strange. So maybe it would be helpful to understand whether where to put this inductive coupling, although we tested several different places in the phone and, and so on. But this 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 is not showing showing very good good things and I I think this is not any kind of winning solutions to solve these uh, connectivity problems. I also tested this in a hiking trip in North Finland with, with bad coverage areas. In some places you can connect to mobile phones and but mostly not. And in this trip we had foldable yaki antenna with us so that it is smaller in size and goes easily into your backpack. But the results were again similar. So usually it this, this inductive platform did not help at all, but just once it provided connectivity when mobile could not connect at all. So not, not very promising results. And I have discussed with others who have used this device and they, are, they have same kind of observations. But what had more impact in the connectivity was, was then this mobile device itself. So we, in this hike, we had four persons and four different mobile phones and there were big, big differences in this con con connectivity of these mobile phones. So they, they should basically satisfy the, it was LTE network there, so to satisfy this LTE standard <coughs> requirements, which are same for all phones, but still, still the differences were very huge. So we had two, two Apple phones, one, one plus phone and one Honor plus phone. <clears throat> and one of those Apple phones was very good, much, much better than the rest. And then the, this Honor was worst of those all. But the second Apple was just a little bit better than this Honor. So you cannot trust that if one manufacturer make a good phone model, another model works same way. So it's impossible to say that they all are working well. And if you are, if you or regular people are looking for good device for these remote areas or good phone for these remote areas, these values are unfortunately not among those which are measured. At least I couldn't found any information about this sensitivity of different phones. Uh, and another problem is in the winter time when it's cold and these co uh, mobile phones easily freeze. From that you can find some information, especially among the out or gamers which report in some web pages that how how well their phones re can resist cold or do they operate in cold at all. Okay, that kind of information could be collected from this inductive platforms. I would not use it again, not after these measurements. And I, if I have to buy buy new mobile phone, <coughs> it, it was mine, this Honor, but I have now changed it. But it was really, really bad in both in sensitivity sense and cold resistance sense. But I would try, <coughs> I would try to find some information from the internet if they are listing somewhere these sensitivity values. Then about this modem measurement results. So we use this jet. The MC801 modem, which is figured there. And the reason why we selected this was that it has two external antenna connect connections there. So two, two antenna MIMO systems 
can be used with that. And it also has inside two, uh, two antennas, so it's my, my MIMO system. But when we tried with these external antennas, they did not provide any improvement. We measured with the spectrum analyzers these antennas, and we can see, clearly see the better signal power with the antennas. Uh, but not with, not with this modem. And we, we think that the reason is that it's not functioning at all with these external antennas. So there is some malfunctioning or coding error there. So they are not either recognizing that external antennas are connected or the connections are not <laughs> finalized in the in the actual device. And one lesson what we learned from that is that we should not believe what the manufacturers or resellers are claiming, but you should right away test your system and then return the device if it's not working as it should. Uh, the reason why I'm saying this is that because of the COVID, we were not able to test this when we got it. It was almost half a year delay, and then we, when we observed this, it was too late. But anyway, it's good lesson and a good warning for people that say they should be aware of that these kind of problems may occur. And results, uh, results download, uh, download speed results are here. Uh, this is from the cottage, so the first row there is the outside cottage, it's, it was the lowest point where we were. Then we were in inside cottage downstairs, then inside cottage upstairs, so the highest point. So three different elevations with, in the place. And you can clearly see that if you go higher, you get better results. And usually in low points, we only saw 3G connectivity. Uh, but uh, some, sometimes there were short periods of 4G, but then it changed back, back to 3G. But if we use this modem, then it, then it was always 4G. So there is clear improvement on that. And you can see also that data rates are improving when you are using this model. So this, this, this kind of solutions would be, would be very good device to improve, uh, improve your connectivity. So of course, you have to know where the base station is so that you can locate the modem correctly beside correct window. Or if you have outdoor modem, that is even better than, than, than you can put that in the roof or high in the wall. And that helps even more. But this is the device that I, I, I could buy myself. Yeah. Then I go to the use case transport. That is one of the use cases in the project. And this is about MEC and border crossing things. So first, First, there is some thinking of how this mech should help in things, and then some information of actual end users. So in the beginning of the project, uh, we heard that there could be 10 minute breaks in applications when, when they, they are crossing national borders but we don't know what were the applications and why, why this happens, that, that is still unclear. Uh, uh, but we were thinking that this mobile edge or multi-access edge computing might help because, uh, because it allows to put this critical information close to the users and maybe that would help to mitigate these breaks. But what, when you are doing border crossing, there are different kinds of challenges that may, 
might cause these things. So one thing is roam. Of course, if you are using mobile phone to do in this connectivity, it is doing this handover very fastly. So it's not about this handover problems. There must be something else. Uh, maybe it's not even related to this roaming problems, but maybe it's then about different operators which are using different 5G systems and Mac and then later on these Mac architectures. So technical things. There might be different technology that is used that might cause problems. Uh, in some cases, there might be different regulation later on when you we are when you are trying to use your application in different countries and, and so on. But we have not yet identified where this happens. And indeed, if you are driving in usual highway or railroad, then you can see similar kind of things with this edge related mobility. So you have to change from base station to another and your critical local information should move with you. This, this border crossing just sets you extra difficulties. Uh, the idea is that this make uh, system support service continuity of the system. So it means that uh, this information must be somehow relocated to new Mac server or edge host or whatever it is called. And, and in this border crossing, if you are driving in your home country, then usually it's just you are using the same operator uh, and it's from one, op one edge to next edge of the same operator. But in the border crossing case, uh, it, it, the operator is changing. Uh, and at the same time, also the technology is changing or might change. Yeah. The re relocation may not be so easy. There might be failures on there that, and it could be too early or too late relocation. Maybe this, I don't. Uh, this late is of course big problem and this, this too early might cause problems if the data gets old and uh, relocation to the wrong host so it cannot be say where which is the correct edge host where this information should go L like if we go to tornio haaparanta area the border is basically in the city big city and you have several sectors there and several base stations, what the phone is seeing. And to, to, what of, to which of those to put this edge, uh, new information, that, that might be the problem. So we should develop some kind of relocation prediction techniques so that we can put these things into correct places and also to avoid unnecessarily data transport. This is not a problem if the amount is small, but if we are starting to send pl plenty of data from all the mobile users, then we might be in problems. Uh, and of course, the border is not very sharp, and that is also that also might uh, make might make this prediction difficult. So if you cross border from Tornio to Haparanda, you still stay in Finnish network until few hundred meters and the change is only 10. So maybe not the first Swedish uh, uh, base station, but the second one. Then to these use cases, uh, what, what we had in the project, we were thinking that in ambulance, this continuous monitoring of the patients and the real time transmission of data to hospital could be one interesting case, especially in this border area where there is cooperation between the hospitals. 
uh, but it also holds in inland of your country. Then uh, warning of obstacles and accidents on the road. That is important application, especially if you are planning your route or you should stop and wait somewhere. And, and also in the future, there could be these alternative road information sent into your car system. Not just listening that from the radio, but get, get information directly to the car. Uh, there are some already existing systems like this reindeer warning system, Porokello, and at least in Finland, they sent this road maintenance info during winter time, real time, or almost real time, and obtaining that information uh, is valuable. But if there is no connectivity from this road maintenance vehicle, to the system, then this information is not on time or up to time. Uh, and there might be also some other, other transport related applications, but it's not, all, not always easy to uh, imagine those. In this, this road maintenance info, we heard from uh, one truck driver in cafeteria along the road when we went to North. Uh, then we contacted some medical care people and also some truck, truck company personnel and asked them if there are delay sensitive applications that should work 24-7. But, but they did not see many Oh, many at, or maybe at all of those. One, one reason in the ambulance case is that these ambulances are quite well equipped independent units and should, should operate by themselves. But they, but they saw few, few possible future needs. And one was this heart attack case. And then it might be very dangerous if the data transfer is delayed or interrupted. But this transfer time where they need it is very short. They talk about two to five minutes. And if you have problems during that point, then, 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 then that, that might have some effects to the patient's safety. They said that the biggest problems are blind spots. So when there is no connectivity or very weak connectivity, because then the data transfer does not succeed. So they have not seen problems in the border crossing. Of course, if this is usual data, then it might be easier. Then possible future use case is this computer tomography helmet. If you have brain infarct and they want to measure you in the ambulance, then that, that is one critical application. So because the time is what matter in this treatment. So the patients should be taken care in very short time, less than four and a half hours. And if you live far away and you will be transported to the bigger hospital, then it might take time and it has to, it would be good if they could follow, follow the patient during that trip. And the data transfer requirements there are quite high, two gigabytes in about less than half an hour. So that, that means that may, maybe, maybe Maybe usual so low data rates along the roads is not sufficient for that service. Then of course they saw the real time video connection and patient parameter transfer between doctor and ambulance is would would be good good application and that is already basically real life 
And of course, if there is bad connectivity in the area, this is not possible. Yeah. And along the road, we have plenty of those places where you have so bad connectivity that you cannot use real-time video. Then the truck personnel said that the, they have on the air, uh, over, over, it's not on the air, but over the air uploads for their truck systems, but there they are not really real time. When, if it's not working just on that moment, then they will do it later when you have connectivity. They are not time critical. Then there are some goods what they are transporting that should be monitored, like cold chains, when you monitor the temperature, location, if you have cash deliverable or you have uh, transporting dangerous goods. But also the, there, this, they are not really so time critical. They, they, they can tolerate breaks. Connectivity is back again, they upload, upload the data. Okay, this ends my presentation. Thank you. Okay, honey, thanks a lot. <coughs> uh, interesting, interesting talk. Uh, I um, um, didn't mention earlier before the talk that 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 we can we can ask questions in the Q and A in the Q and A uh, button on this webinar. Uh, so if there's any questions uh, for Harry, uh, please please add them there and also in the in the, for the con continuing uh, the the next present presenters. But for, for now, Harry, I, I have one, one question. It strikes me that, um, that uh, if these mobile phones are so different in, in performance, it must be really difficult also for operators to give like credible coverage maps, right? Uh, and, and so when you, so the question to, as a starter is like when you were out on the mountains, did, did, did your coverage somehow did you check the coverage maps of the operators and, and how did it match with your experience? Uh, yeah, we know that in that area, we check it uh, or I, I checked it in beforehand so that I know where we, it's a good place to do these measurements, of course. But, but, but they did not help and we did not check the Norway and coverage map because in many places it was Norwegian network, but we were connected, right. not Finnish network. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, yeah but that, that is still, mm. I, I wonder this because they, every phone should satisfy this basic requirement sensitivity limits by default, but still there were huge differences in sensitivity. Maybe they may measure it not without antenna <laughs> and if you then match antenna to that it might make things much more much more worse yeah yeah so so to for this for customers to be more predictable and more manageable and and and, and controllable we, there, there perhaps is a need for some better let's say classification of of phones or or uh, is this is are these these sensitivity things are they available in the specs of the phones could you could you potentially or, or, or you, would you need to refer as a customer to uh, to um, to tests customer tests after they have been been, been released phones or... yeah but i looked for these customer tests and they but they are not reporting this sensitivity no yeah, yeah. No. but maybe there is place for university or lower level education to do these measurements and release them or or, or these outdoor magazines or whatever yeah, yeah or, or regulators right that regulators could uh, could go in and, and and require manufacturers that or phones on the market to have a certain yeah this uh, should certain... be measured with the antennas <laughs> sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah yeah no that's that's a, that's a discussion in itself okay Excellent. Uh, let's see. I don't. Uh, I don't see any further further questions in the uh, in the chat. So um, so let's move on uh, to the next speaker. Um, next speaker is 
uh, Emad Ibrahim, he fr from uh, Lille University of Technology, and he will talk about uh, modulation and polarization with uh, with intelligent surfaces. So, Emad. Yeah. Uh, so, hello everyone. This is Emad Ibrahim, I'm PhD student uh, in the Signal Processing Group at Lille University of Technology. And today I'm glad to have this presentation on uh, polarization shift king with reconfigurable intelligent surface. So the outline of this talk will be as follows. First, I will give a brief introduction on the reconfigurable intelligent surface, risks, and its application. And after that, I will speak about uh, one of the promising application for RIS, which is to use risk for information transfer. And after that, I will speak about our proposed model to deploy this application that mainly depend on polarization shift game. Uh, so a reconfigurable intelligence uh, surface is a Zimplin array that uh, consists of multiple sub wavelengths reflecting element. And this reflecting element is simply a small antenna that uh, re-radiates the incident wave without any amplification. And the basic idea is that each reflecting element is connected to a tunable chip, such as uh, Bindide or Varapur, and can induce an independent and controllable uh, fish ship for the incident signal. Uh, the attractive uh, thing about this uh, is it's a very energy efficient unit that it doesn't consume any power for transmission because it doesn't have an RF chain or a power amplifier, but it only depends on the signal reflection on its element. Uh, in addition uh, to that, using, uh, however, of course, it uh, consumes some power for uh, control and setting the phases of the. Uh, in addition to that, it's very uh, like uh, promising because it can shape the radio wave between the transmitter and the receiver. So it changed like our viewpoint to the conventional communication system, where in conventional communication system we just try to. Uh, like uh, uh, optimize the transmitter and receiver just to compensate the channel effect. However, using this reconfigurable intelligent surface, we can now have a smart radio environment where we can control the propagation environment itself. So we jointly optimize the transmitter, receiver, and the channel environment. And here comes the idea of a smart radio environment that the environment is generated by nature. Uh, but it's uh, programmable by design or more specifically by using reconfigurable intelligent services. So recently, uh, RIS has been uh, utilized for several communication applications, such as, for example, for in coverage enhancement. Uh, we're in uh, this case, we have a user that suffer from uh, blockage, uh, doesn't have a direct link with the base station. So we're going to deploy some reconfigurable intelligent service on some buildings to create like a virtual uh, link uh, to uh, increase the coverage for this particular user. And this uh, could be promising for a millimeter wave communication and tetrahertz communication, uh, where they usually suffer from uh, uh, high sensitivity to blockage. Also, it could be like uh, used to enrich the RT channel uh, with uh, more multipulse. And this uh, like could be promising, especially in point-to-point -point communication, where uh, it's hard in point-to-point -point, uh, uh, MIME communication, uh, given a line of sight environment, to uh, provide a spectral multiplexing aid because the rank of channel metrics is deficient. So we could deploy some risk just to convert a line of sight environment into artificial uh, rich scattering environment and provide a uh, spectral multiplexing gain even if uh, uh, in line of sight environment. Also, it could be used for uh, simultaneous wireless information and power transfer, where uh, wireless uh, power transfer target uh, the transfer of energy without uh, the use of any physical lens, uh, physical cables. So we could use some uh, reconfigurable intelligent surface to like uh, focus the scattered wave to the rectangle of some internet of things device just to recharge zero load. Also it could be promising in a massive device to device communication where here there is act like a, a reflection, reflection hub that uh, adjusted phases to uh, add constructively the, the signal at the desired user 
and add destructively the signal at long intended user. Also, it can be used to assist cell edge user, where cell edge user usually suffer from high signal activation for the desired signal, and also high interfering signal. So if we deploy like a, a reconfigurable intelligent surface on the cell edge, we can have a sort of uh, like a hot spot at the, uh, at, uh, the cell edge and the interfere, interference free region in the cell edge. Also, it can assist non-orthogonal multiple axes, uh, where uh, non-orthogonal multiple axes target uh, the multiplexing of multiple users on the same time frequency, in the same uh, orthogonal channel. Uh, however, uh, non-orthogonal multiple axis is not always preferable. It's preferable only if the channel vectors between the users that uh, we are going to multiplex are uh, more aligned. So we could use the risks uh, just to align the channel vector between the user that, that we are, would like to uh, multiplex together. And all these ideas depend on one thing is that we try to program or control the propagation environment itself. So now I speak about uh, risks for information transfer. So uh, most of the current research, uh, like uh, deploy uh, or uh, focused on deploying a reconfigurable intelligent surface, just to assist communication between a transmitter and receiver. However, one of the promising applications for this that it can be deployed to act as an access point itself for in, uh, information transfer. Where in this uh, application, as shown in the figure to the left, we have a, like an ambient or a dedicated RF source. Uh, and the idea that there is, we will we'll, we'll utilize this uh, RF source to encode the information data that exists at the risk itself. And this uh, information source can be some sensors that is uh, connected to the risk. Uh, and, uh, collect some measurement and would like to send this kind of measurement to a certain destination. And this application could be promising, especially uh, in wireless sensor network. In addition to these applications that we use risk only for uh, information transfer, we can like uh, merge it with uh, uh, conventional applications that uh, assist communications to so have a, a transmitter that has information source one, and we have a risk here that has its own information and would like to assist uh, in, uh, the conventional communication link between the transmitter and receiver using the pinforming gain of the risk. And they also would like to encode that data at the risk uh, in terms of the reflected wave from it. So it can be jointly both uh, application. So in the literature uh, for this uh, particular application, uh, there are two main uh, schemes that uh, utilize uh, risk for information transfer. In the first scheme, uh, the risk uh, is deployed uh, and uh, the alternate the states of the reflecting element in the risk between uh, on and off state uh, to create a sort of amplitude shifting for the encoding of uh, the data uh, at the, uh, that exists at the risk. Uh, so you can control the on and off state of the reflecting element in the risk by controlling the amplitude reflection coefficient of uh, each element in the risk. So you now have like a more advanced the reconfigurable intelligent surface that has uh, two freedom control over phase and control also over uh, amplitude reflection coefficient. And this like uh, complicates the risk fabrication. In addition to that, given that uh, some uh, element in the risk will uh, be turned off, so you underutilize the, the beam forming gain of the risk. Uh, the second scheme that uh, exists in the literature for uh, risk inform, uh, for information transfer is to use risk uh, to perform a space shifting modulation. Where in this case, uh, the, 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 the risk encodes the information data uh, in terms of uh, in the indices of the transmitter or the received antenna, uh, simply by maximizing the received SNR at the target uh, or the selected antenna index. So you create a sort of a space shift king. However, one of the limitations of this scheme and in general in a space shift king 
that uh, spaceship picking will require a rich scattering environment to have like uh, uncorrelated channel vector among different uh, antenna indices. Uh, so in the case of line of sight environment, uh, given that the high correlation between antenna indices, uh, this idea we will not work properly because if you are going to maximize certain antenna index to encode certain symbol, you are going to maximize the other antenna indices. Now I speak about our proposed uh, idea for this application that mainly depend on polarization shifting. So we propose a novel uh, risk assisted uh, information transfer scheme, spe especially uh, for a uh, line of sight environment by encoding the information data in terms of the polarization state of the reflected wave from the risk. So the polarization state of, of the electromagnetic wave uh, simply describes the orientation of the electric field relative to the direction of propagation. And there are three main uh, polarization states for any electromagnetic wave, which is linear polarization, circular polarization, and elliptical polarization. In the proposed scheme, we rely on one of the promising uh, functions uh, that uh, re rarely utilized in the literature that uh, in addition to the main function of the risk that it offers some sort of pre-informing gain, it also can be deployed to uh, control the polarization state of the reflected wave, as shown in this figure where we have a risk and incident wave with certain polarization state and reflected wave with a controllable polarization state. Uh, the idea behind the risk polarization uh, uh, manipulation become possible thanks to the deployment of a dual polarized reflecting element. So uh, as shown in this figure, we have here is that it's constructed of a dual polarized reflecting element. The basic idea is that the dual polarized reflecting element uh, could excite two orthogonal polarization state and induce independent phase shift for each polarization state whenever a wave is incident to them. So in this figure, we have uh, a risk constructive of uh, slant 45, slant negative 45, dual polarized reflecting element. And this uh, figure represents a single reflecting element. We could see that we have an instant wave and the two excited uh, ref uh, ref uh, reflected wave, one from the slant 45 and one for the slant negative 45. And given that we have a full control on the phase shift induced for the red and the blue wave, so we can set uh, the phase shift difference between the two waves. So we can control the polarization state of the resultant wave, which is simply the summation of two waves. So if we sum these two waves, given that there is a phase shift difference equals zero, we have a vertical polarized wave. And if we sum it, given that we have a phase shift difference equals pi, we have a horizontal polarized wave. And in case of pi bar two, negative pi bar two, we have right and left circular polarized a reflected wave. And of course, for other fish shift, we have other elliptical polarization state. So using a dual polarized uh, reflecting element in the race will give you the ability to control the polarization state for each reflecting element. So uh, our uh, idea to, uh, to perform like uh, risk for information transfer application, that we deploy a risk to offer two important functions. The first function that the risk uh, pin steers the incident wave toward the receiver in order to increase the received signal strength at the receiver. And the second function that the risk alternates the polarization state of the reflected wave as a function of the transmitted symbol. So in this figure, we have uh, like create a sort of a quadrature polarization shift again. We have uh, here selected zero, zero to be horizontal polarized, zero, one right circular polarized, one zero vertical polarized and one one left circular polarized. And as a receiver, we have a dual polarized uh, antenna. Uh, so we can detect the received polarization state and, the, and detect back or, um, or demodulate the transmitted uh, symbol. In our simulation for this uh, like early stage work, we only addressed uh, the risk assisted primary polarization shift again. So the risk will only alternate the position state between vertical and horizontal for uh, one and zero respectively. 
we uh, have a line of sight environment and we assume uh, that, uh, and in line of sight environment, like the orthogonality between two uh, orthogonal, uh, or the orthogonality between two polarization state is maintained. However, due to the different orientation between this dual polarized uh, receiver antennas and the dual polarized reflected uh, wave, a polarization mismatch will occur. That's represented in this figure, that this is uh, the orthogonal reflected wave, vertical, horizontal, and this represents the orientation of the dual polarized antenna. So what uh, okay, here, what this effect of PETA is the polarization mismatch loss. So we propose two different scheme uh, for this uh, kind of uh, application. First scheme that is encode the information data in terms of the polarization state of the reflected wave, uh, independently of uh, the polarization mismatch that occur in the wireless channel. And this means that as the receiver, we need to track and correct for the polarization mismatch that occur in the channel. And we propose a, a second scheme that uh, can offer a kind of uncoherent demodulation uh, that we uh, encode the information data here in the polarization state of the overall composite wire channel, which means that we include, uh, in addition, uh, we include uh, also the polarization mismatch that occur in the wireless channel. And this means that the receiver in the second scheme uh, doesn't need to do polarization mismatch tracking and correction. And this simplify uh, the receiver structure uh, greatly. Uh, so like uh, our simulation result is uh, as shown here, we have here our simulation parameter. And in this figure to the left, we like simulate the received SNR versus the polarization mismatch angle. And uh, when we deploy a risk of uh, surface area equal one meter square, and we could see for scheme one, that is uh, coherent detection uh, that we need to track as a polarization state and correct for it. The received SNR is independent on the mismatch. And in case of scheme two, that uh, uh, uncoherent uh, detection, no need for tracking, polarization mismatch, and correction for it, the performance is dependent on uh, the polarization mismatch angle. Where uh, the, the received uh, SNR for scheme uh, two is uh, periodic with speed equal 90, and we could see like uh, there is a 3 dB loss. Uh, in case of polarization mismatch angle of 45 degree. Also in this figure, we simulate the bit error rate versus the risk surface area for the two scheme proposed. For scheme one, uh, it's in the, its performance is independent on uh, uh, the polarization mismatch angle. And for scheme two, we simulated for three different polarization mismatch angles, zero, 15, and 45. We could see that the scheme one achieves the best performance and the scheme uh, two achieves similar performance given that uh, there is no polarization mismatch angle as, uh, as shown in this uh, point. And uh, the performance of scheme two will become worse in case of uh, polarization mismatch angle increased to 15 and in case it increased to 45. So we provide two different scheme one uh, uh, with uh, best performance and one was uh, like a little bit uh, worse performance. However, uh, one of them need polarization mismatch tracking correction and one doesn't need this uh, kind of uh, tracking and correction. And as a future rule, we plan to exploit the real uh, polarization control ability to develop also higher order modulation scheme and to develop different communication systems that could offer uh, multiplexing gain and diversity gain in the degree freedom that offer pi polarization. So thank you very much for your attention and looking to have all the, your questions. Great. Uh, thanks, Imad. Thanks. Uh, so um, I was wondering, uh, so when you decouple the, uh, the the transmitter or the, the the power the power feeder right in this scheme, yeah. you decouple it from uh, from the transmitter. You basically use an external external power source, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that means that your um, 
your energy, your 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 transmitter information is is, is very energy efficient, right? Yeah, especially if you use like an ambient or RF source that is not dedicated for this communication, like existing the environment. But yeah, it will be like it's very yeah. efficient, and also it is very efficient because it doesn't have an RF chain power amplifier. It only levers the reflection of the yeah. And potentially, you could also use, I guess, that RF source for several transmitters. Then exactly true. Like for several reasons and singular, uh, singular RF source. Okay. okay. And then on one of your figures, you had um, you had uh, basically when you plot your performance, you do it. You don't do it through uh, with the SNR, right? Which is more uh, the traditional. You you plot yeah. it versus the area, right? Yeah, yeah, because. Uh, of course, you can't plot it versus the SNR because it, at the end it's a link budget equation and you can find analytically SNR yeah. here. Uh, but, uh, like for certain peak transmitted here, certain noise power for certain configuration distance, uh, under this risk area, you have this performance. So, it's there are multiple ways to present mm. your uh, performance. But uh, I believe this is a good way because what matters is the surface area, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, so when you plot here, for instance, in this, oh, this is your example, right? Your case, you you go up to one or two square meters typically in order to, yeah. to, to really get low low bit error rates, right? This is uncoded, I guess. So so. Yeah, uh, yeah this uh, uncoded. Would could you say that it in terms of in terms of size or form factor that this is perhaps inefficient? Uh, why it's inefficient? Well, you need a large you need, you need a large uh, large area for yeah, your but, for your, uh, for your space. Yeah, yeah, I get your point. But this for this kind of location of our stores, receiver, yeah. and this. So you know, it may be ten centimeters square be sufficient for certain other uh, like configuration. Uh, so it depends like this. But of course, one of the fundamental uh, drawbacks of this it's yeah. like uh, unfavorable post loss model. Yeah. So it's uh, more uh, favorable to use this for short communication, short uh, length mm -hmm. communication, because mm -hmm. it has very unfavorable post loss model. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Uh, excellent. Thanks a lot. Um, it is. We are a few minutes before ten. I promised a small, a small, uh, like five minute break for for um, before we move on. And um, um, so we'll do that now. Um, take some, uh, perhaps a cup of coffee or fresh air. We resume. Let's say in eight minutes. Five minutes up. Uh, five minutes past uh, past ten with the third uh, presentation then. Okay, see you then. Hey, yeah. Hej, du är tillbaka. Ja, kan du höra mig? Du ja, jag svarar i alla fall. Vi ska se om hur videon ser ut. Det ser jättefint ut, bra. Det ser mm. okej okay ut. Uh, Skulle du kunna dela slidesen åt mig om jag presenterar? Funkar uh, ljudkvaliteten med, med micken i laptopen? Ja, det går bra. Jättebra. Ja, jättebra. Uh, jag kan göra det, inget problem. För jag har inte ens powerpoint. På min privat. <laughs> Nej, jag, jag delar det. Inget problem. Ja, men super. Är du... Um... Irriterande att det funkar så jo. smasigt med... Men uh, vill du... Uh, du kan ta det nu efter pausen då, eller? Du ja, inte byta. ja, men det borde, vi behöver, det borde funka. Vi, vi behöver inte byta plats då. Nej, Nej. jag tycker Nej. inte det. Okej, okay. ja, men då vet jag. Perfekt. Bra. Så du för allt strul. Nej, det, är... <laughs> det går bra. Ja.
Okay, <clears throat> welcome back uh, again, everybody. Then, um, time for the third presentation in this uh, in this session. Then, uh, the first uh, or the, the the next presenter is uh, Sara Sandberg uh, here in Lulio with, with uh, Ericsson Research. And Sara, you will talk about time critical communications. Um, okay, I will uh, I will show your slides, and you just. Uh, say when i need to change thanks a lot i had some uh, terrible problems with zoom <laughs> so, there you go there you go right uh, as yep said i'm uh, sara sandberg and i'm from ericsson research here in julia and i'm currently heading a research project focusing on 5g for manufacturing and industrial iot and here time critical communication plays a crucial role. So I'm really happy to be here today and talk about this. In the presentation today, I will tell you about what time critical communication actually means, uh, the use cases where it's applicable and how it can be achieved with 5G NR. I will also give you a brief look at our latest measurement results when it comes to latency and reliability. So let's get started. Next slide, please. Right, so let me first emphasize the difference here between mobile broadband or EMBB as you call it and time critical communication. Uh, as you see in the first uh, sketch here uh, to the left, uh, a system designed for MBB actually maximizes the data rates without any guarantee regarding the latency. We call this best effort. And you can see that we have some, we have a number of packets coming through with very low latency, but we also have quite a bit of a tail to the right in the left figure there. In contrast, in the figure to the right, uh, time critical communication is actually designed to secure data delivery with specific latency bounds. We have X milliseconds pointed out here in the figure. And we, we want to achieve this with the desired reliability, say Y percent. Uh, so the actual latency demands here, the X milliseconds, that depends on the use case we have and can range from tens of milliseconds down to say one millisecond. The reliability requirements we put on time critical communication also comes within a range from something like 99% to five nines reliability, like 99.999%. Uh, and in 3DPP, reliability is actually defined as the success rate of delivering data within a certain time constraint. So this means that when addressing time critical use cases, there are the fundamental trade-offs that needs to be considered between latency and other KPIs like throughput that we optimize for when we design for mobile broadband. Uh, and with time critical communication, the idea is really to prioritize latency over throughput. And this is the main fundamental difference. Let's now take a look at the use cases. We can go to the next slide, please. Uh, so we have a number of use cases requiring time critical communication. And here we have focused on uh, four fundamental categories that are common across several industry verticals and can be applied in many different areas. So we have industrial control, mobility automation, remote control, and also covered here is real-time media. And each of these categories then in turn include a wide range of use cases, as you can see in the, the gray uh, circles here. Uh, and uh, these use cases have a large range of time critical requirements, and it's the requirements in terms of latency that is shown here. From tens of milliseconds bounded latency down to single digit millisecond bounded latency to the right. 
So for example, for remote control, uh, we can do a lot of good with, with tens of millisecond latency. Uh, but if we want to have remote control with haptic feedback, for example, we need a uh, um, more stringent, uh, lower bounded latency to handle this in a good way. So some use cases also bring additional characteristics in terms of higher uplink bit rates uh, and coverage availability than mobile broadband. We also have use cases uh, that are rate adaptive uh, and can actually adapt the bit rate in order to meet the latency targets. And these characteristics are all things we have to take into account in, in the design of the time critical communication system to achieve as good performance as possible. For example, if we have a rate adaptive uh, application, we can, we can reduce the rate if there seems to be congestion in the system. You can take the next slide. Uh, so, so to address a diverse range of time critical use cases and enable all the new opportunities, we need an end-to-end -end solution with which it, which is it possible to guarantee consistent low latency and high reliability. Uh, and at Ericsson, we are currently working on a new software toolbox that provides this functionality. We had a marketing release just a few weeks ago uh, where, where we um, released this time critical communication at scale for 5G networks uh, toolbox. Uh, so with this toolbox, we will provide a range of low latency capabilities from around 50 milliseconds down to one millisecond and with a range of reliability levels. However, the full range here of latencies and reliabilities will not be available from the beginning as it requires quite a lot from our networks, but also from our device partners. We really need to have devices in place uh, that can also handle these low latencies and uh, reliabilities. So because of this, the required functionality of this toolbox will be released in a stepwise approach, where the first features addressing the more relaxed latency and reliability within these ranges will be available, say, within half a year. Um, and as we saw on the previous slide, there are actually many use cases that have these relaxed requirements. So, so the ability, just to point out also that the ability of time critical communication in 5G to offer a high degree of reliability and this consistent low latency that we are talking about, it's really the biggest differentiator between 5G and other wireless technologies. We can go into a bit more detail also of the Ericsson Time Critical Communication Toolbox on the next slide. This is quite a busy slide, uh, but I will highlight a few thing things there. Uh, so in the blue circles here, uh, you see six major causes of latency in interruption in mobile networks that we want to focus on in the time critical communication toolbox. And, and to handle these causes of latency, we, we have this congestion is one cause, uh, radio environment also causes uh, latency, uh, mobility interruptions can happen when we have to do handovers. Uh, there are some latencies added by the standards and the protocols like we have scheduling delays or it takes time until we have a scheduling opportunity. That's a better way of phrasing it. Fiber saving functionality can actually also cause um, additional latency. For example, if we have um, optimized for using DRX and go down into sleeping modes. The network topology is another cause of latency. Um, for example, if, if it takes time, uh, it depends on where we have the, the core network and uh, functionality and 
how long it takes to to do uh, for the transport. Below these blue circles, we're talking about the, the causes of latency, we have a number of, we can say, solutions uh, to these or relevant tools or features that can be considered. And as an example, to address congestion, uh, the tools that are proposed are rate adaptation, we have slicing, admission control is another one, and scheduling. And for many of these solutions, we actually already have, we have this in place, but it's not optimized for uh, consistent low uh, latency. And this is what we have to do now. Another aspect uh, that is shown here in the, in the black circle, uh, another aspect that we need to consider is the planning of capacity growth. Uh, there are important tools already available, like massive MIMO radio solutions, for example, uh, which are more resilient to the traffic growth than, for example, classic radios. Uh, another thing uh, that is important is that many of the use cases requiring consistent low latency, they are uplink heavy. And with that, I mean that uh, in contrast to to mobile broadband uh, use cases, which is typically watching video or so on your uh, smartphone. This is very downlink heavy, mainly downlink and a little bit of uplink traffic. Uh, many of these new use cases, they are on the other hand, uplink heavy. For example, remote control um, of machines or uh, trains in harbor or so. Uh, you need the operator to, to see the video, which is transmitted in uplink. Uh, and to handle this, we might need new TDD patterns, for example, which allows more, uh, more time for uplink transmissions than downlink transmissions. So we can go to the next slide. And and here I just want to point out that we have talked, so far we have focused mainly on the radio access network and how it can be improved to achieve consistent low latency. It, but we also need to consider the other parts of the network or the, uh, the end to end uh, to enable uh, and consider the latency added by all these different uh, components. We have the networks, but we also have latency components from the applications, uh, from the devices, uh, the transport network, as I mentioned, the core network, and so on. And it's important that all these uh, components uh, step up in terms of latency and reliability. In the end, the end-to-end -end latency budget is the sum of the individual latency contributions from all the components. And the end-to-end -end reliability cannot really be better than the reliability of the weakest link. Right, we can go to the next slide. And I will now show you a few examples of the performance measurement results that we have done within Ericsson. And the measurements shown here are based on commercial 5G network components, uh, uses mid-band spectrum. Uh, and as I said earlier, all components in the latency are important here. And here we are utilizing a local dedicated core network on the factory premises. Uh, so that the latency of the transport network will be minimized. Uh, in this uh, measurement campaign, uh, we also tested two different commercially available uh, 5G devices, as you see with the blue and red bars in the latency figure shown here. Looking at the results, we see that both devices have a low median latency. That's what you see to the left in, in the figure. We see though that latency differs quite a lot between the two different devices. So it's just below four milliseconds for one of the devices, 
while it's above six milliseconds one-way uh, latency for the other device. It's actually worth uh, noting here that the latency performance can differ substantially between devices, even if both 5G devices actually use the same 5G mode and chipset, like in this case. So in general, the latency stays low, also when considering the 99 percentile. However, good latency performance cannot be fully maintained beyond the 99th percentile, as we can see in the, the bars uh, to the right. Let's remember though, that even in the order of, as we see here, 13 millisecond latency at the 99th of 9th percentile is sufficiently good for many of the applications we saw on, on the application slide. So to conclude, the main takeaway from this slide is that it's clear that MBB networks, I mean, this is uh, commercial, based on commercial 5G network components uh, that are available now, uh, and it's not optimized for latency, but, and it's clear here that it's not optimized for latency, and that's why we see the, the behavior we see here in this uh, figure. We can anyhow see that we get a very good latency, even though the network and devices are actually optimized for uh, maximum throughput and not low latency. But if we go to the next slide, I will show you some measurements results from, from a 5D prototype system uh, that we are working with. Uh, so here we are using pre-commercial uh, URLLC, or ultra reliable low latency communication functionality, uh, which has been implemented. I want to emphasize here though, you see some pictures uh, on the slide of the, of the network side of this prototype. Uh, the UE uh, is built, uh, is a prototype built in-house in at Ericsson. And we are not building UEs otherwise. So the form factor of the UE is not such that you can carry it around, rather roll it around in a wagon. So it's really something for our, our lab. Anyway, utilizing some of, of the URLLC features that have been standardized in NR release 15 and release 16, we see that consistent low latency can actually be achieved, like you see here in the figure. Uh, so both for the median, for the 99th percentile and the 99.9 percentile results, uh, we see that below one millisecond latency is reached consistently. And uh, as we can see also here by looking at the, the percentiles, uh, there is lit very little difference in the latency. So going forward, this is the performance we will see in commercial available networks and devices, uh, but this is still a few years away. As I said, the, the functionality for time-critical communication will come in a phased approach, starting next year with the first uh, features, and then moving towards more and more strict latency requirements. So the next slide, please. Just a summary. Uh, so with time-critical communication, we go from best effort optimized for throughput to bounded latency, which is optimized then for low latency and reliability instead. And for many use cases, cases, it is the fact that the latency is consistently low in the range of tens of milliseconds or so. Uh, it's this uh, fact that is important rather than having a very low latency for some of the packets, while some of them that you see on the 99th percentile or so and have a much larger latency. We also saw from the prototype measurements that the 5G standard can actually provide support for bounded one-way latency below one millisecond. And as I said, as this requires significant changes both in our networks and in, in the devices, 
product support for time critical communication will be a few will come in a phased approach and some of the most uh, demanding features will come in a few years or so so i also give here links uh, to a blog post on time critical communication as well as release material for this time critical communication toolbox for anyone that is interested in learning a bit more and with that i end my presentation and open up for any questions please okay Thanks a lot, Sarah. Uh, nice uh, to hear uh, all these uh, these uh, results. Uh, I have one. Uh, I see one question in in the, the Q and A here. Uh, it's actually about the prototype system, and uh, it's it's in the it's in the millimeter wave uh, bands. Is the is mm. uh, is is, is uh, you you mentioned? And what are the reasons for this prototype to have the to have that? Uh, with in relation perhaps to this uh, the time the, the, the right I, I would say that the, the main reason for going to millimeter wave i mean of course we, we want to go to millimeter wave because we have uh, we can get more spectrum so we can get higher throughputs and so on from the time critical communication perspective it's rather the fact that when we go higher up in, in frequency uh, we also can go higher in terms of uh, subcarrier. Uh, ah, <laughs> no, 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 subcarrier spacing, and when we go higher in subcarrier spacing, we have shorter time slots, uh, and these shorter time slots means that we get the lower round trip time. We can we can quicker get uh, we get more often the scheduling. Uh, opportunities and we can do uh, retransmissions quicker as well mm. Mm. it's really the the subcarrier spacing mm, that is the, the thing right right okay thanks i have one i have one, one question myself as well so so um it reminds a lot about uh, about in the times of 4G, when there was this, when there was this discussion of fairness in the in the uh, among users, uh, it was also a new, uh, like a new metric that turned up. We had these best effort schemes, and uh, there was the the idea of having users uh, to create them as fair as possible, rather than just uh, best effort, really truly best effort, right? And uh, mm. and we had, and the solution was all this the schedulers and the schedulers that you had, and it reminds me a lot here also because in four out of those six boxes. Uh, there was a scheduler mentioned as, as somehow in the solutions, right? In, in the, mm. in the, and so, so to some extent, there is a, uh, there's a, 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 an important part is scheduling here. Right? Yes, again. And so <laughs> so my, my, quest, my concrete question is, to what extent is this scheduler being standardized as well? Or is it free? Uh, not not much at all uh, would oh. be uh, would be my answer um, oh. i'm not fully on top of it but i haven't seen anything the scheduler oh. is typically not not being standardized i mean no. uh, so so this is one of the uh, proprietary solutions within yeah. every um, company ma making this i mean yeah. both on the device side and from from network side so we are working a lot on on scheduling and what what can we do to improve mm. things here yeah. but um, it's, nothing it's, it's, that really needs i mean we can do our own solutions and make things better mm. without telling our competitors about it because mm. standardization is not needed here really yeah, so it's really a, a, a critical, uh, let's say, differentiator among uh, vendors and, and, uh, yes. and networks then. Mm, is, definitely. Is also yeah. 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 On the other hand, you said you mentioned something about the, 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 the UE side, right? That it's, uh, you showed some, uh, some uh, let's say, sensitivity to the, to the, to the UE. To actually, exactly. So yeah. as a vendor, you, you don't have much control over that. And so there may be some need for, for additional standardization on the UE side. Right, and you, you perhaps you touched on that on one of your last slides on the U, in these low latency modes um, that, that UEs may be certain requirements later on, right? Uh, to um, to guarantee these these um, these uh, robust latency robustness. To me, it's not obvious 
that it has to be standardized. I think uh, I think often it's about putting requirements um, on the device vendors as well. I mean, mm. yes. um, yeah. it's it's a lot about. Uh, we have seen, for example, that a lot of latency in some devices is added by the actual. Uh, it doesn't come from the chips, but how how the rest of the implementation on the device is done. So it's, I mean, to a lot, large extent, uh, how much you spend on the the equipment in the device uh, as well. Yeah. No. Okay. So this UE site optimization, it is an issue, but it okay whether it uh, whether it needs to be standardized or not. That that's perhaps not. Uh, but not but so. it's definitely important that all the yeah. different components here uh, take their responsibility of yeah. reducing the latency as far as possible. Yeah. I mean, you know, not not only networks and devices, but also the other. I mean, on the application. Uh, side we can, mm. video codecs and so on must also do what they can to reduce latency yeah yeah okay good uh thanks a lot um, thank you um so uh, let's unshare this um and go back to the uh, to the to the um the agenda so the last presentation so i'm actually introducing myself here now um i will i will talk in i will change my slides and i will talk about the the digital divide uh, let's let's see if i can Okay, there you go. So, so the 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 my presentation is is uh, is titled "Will Five G Bridge the Digital Divide?" and uh, uh, it's it's actually uh, I will I will talk about the the, gener the different generations in some sense, but also uh, show some case studies of on the Swedish side um, for measuring uh, uh, coverage and addressing and, and quantifying. Uh, um, uh, cellular coverage um, in the rural regions. So with digital divide here, what, the, what, what is meant in this presentation is the, the urban the urban rural divide that uh, that um, uh, arguably is, is, is growing and or, or emerging. So I used to well let's 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 start with this slide in Sweden uh, the two the, the, the regulator and the operators they they uh, uh, have announced that in the coming years, 2G and 3G networks will be shut down. Like the first generation networks were shut down around 2005, I believe, in Sweden. And uh, now it is time for the second and third generations networks uh, to be shut down. Uh, and this will be uh, be done by at latest uh, in the in the plans by 20, the end of 2025. So that's in in, in four years time. Uh, so. Uh, a quick look at the coverage maps. This is one of the opera. This is the opera Talia. Uh, you, they have this. This uh, you can you can immediately. This is one of the first things you'll see when you look at coverage maps. This is two G, three G, and four G, and perhaps also the the initial five G is, is there. But but this is the coverage for two uh, G and and three G and four G today, um, according to some some um, some sensitivity or some 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 level of connectivity. And uh, I, we, you can remove 2G and 3G manually yourself as a, as, a, as a customer on this side. And this is the coverage of 4G only. So this is somehow the challenge because the operators today say we will have better coverage uh, after 2025 when we have fully migrated to 4G and 5G then. Um, but, but here you can with, we can with our own, our own immediately with our own eyes see the, the challenge and uh, so there won't be so much of a challenge in the urban regions along the coast. Uh, there will be coverage. There is already coverage today with 4G. Um, but you can imagine the immense challenge this is. Now, obviously, there is already a lot of infrastructure. But uh, and when you ask the operators, uh, they say there will be better, better, better um, um, uh, coverage uh, in 2025 than, um, than there is uh, uh, today. 
but there's no really means of, 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 of pushing the operators to do that. It's, it's, it's not very committing uh, to, to make these kind of statements today because there is no requirements of coverage uh, uh, in, in, in spectrum licenses that are being, uh, being sold today. So, so there's not there's not much committing for the operators to say that, and there is uh, there is reason for concern, especially in the rural regions, because already after the closing of one G, uh, we have we must have in mind that coverage in some sense became worse in the rural regions. Uh, one, the, the NMT networks were known to have very nice coverage. Uh, on top of this, Atelia is also already since a decade working on, uh, on shutting down the copper network. And especially in rural regions where there is no fiber, um, customers are, 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 are referred to um, mobile broadband as, as a solution, mobile, a fixed broadband solution or fixed wireless access essentially through the, through the mobile networks. Um, so this goes hand in hand. So this is yet another reason to, to, to have some concerns for that. Meanwhile, the government and the EU have, have uh, str strict targets, uh, not only on the, on the, um, on the, uh, the fixed axis, uh, like 100% of the, of the population must have uh, 30 megabits per second. 100, that's all of us, right? Even the most remote, uh, remote people should have 30 megabits per second by the same year in 2025, the same year when 2G and 3G will be shut down. And at the same time, mobile coverage should be wherever people reside and move. And, um, and um, that's uh, people reside and move also in rurality. So the question is, if when, we, when 5G will, 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 um, will be rolled out now in the coming years, um, will it improve the situation as the operator says? And if it improves actually for whom is actually uh, the improvement? Where is the improvement uh, being measured? So this is the slide I typically show in this, in this um, uh, context. We, we already have today a, an urban regime and a rural regime, and it's not really on. It's not really technical. It's not even. Uh, uh, it has no, nothing to do with the generation. Uh, this this has has been there all the time since the first generation of of, of mobile systems, and uh, there is an, a reason uh, where we have uh, you could say digital fertility. The market mechanisms work well. There is coverage for everyone. There's good business cases, and on the other hand, you have a digital, let's say, des digital desert, uh, where the market mechanisms don't work, and there are no business cases for fiber and radio. And this is really independent of the generation. And um, um, there is, in that sense, the, the question: Will five G um, bridge this divide in some way is not is is not is ill posed in the, in the first place uh, since this is uh, really it has it has little to do with the actual technical um, mobile cellular generation so question is <clears throat> in order to assess this really more more systematically we need to somehow uh, quantify this we need to measure we need to quantify and and Potentially, we need to communicate this and perhaps visualize this uh, this divide. So, so in this talk, I, I will mostly talk about the first uh, two points to measure the divide and to and to somehow quantify um, to, to to quantify the width of or the depth of this of this rural divide. So, the first uh, study I want to mention here is a study that what was published earlier this year. The paper, the study, the measurements was were already uh, done like one and two years ago. It was a measurement campaign in the north of Sweden uh, by the by the um, uh, the Norbotten uh, Council and the uh, a company IQM Tel. And basically, <clears throat> you see here a backpack with uh, with nine, I think nine nine phones they all were locked to a certain uh, technology a certain generation and a certain operator um, so and these backpacks were provided with a big battery and they could be put uh, operate autonomously and um, be put they were put in buses in garbage trucks in taxis in ambulances and they were moving around for weeks or months um, making uh, coverage measurements in the in the whole of the of the count of the the, the 
the, the nor whole of Norbotten. So it had ended up, I mean, Norbotten has about a quarter of a million residents. There were 11,000 kilometers of roads that had been covered by, by these measurements. And there were in all in all, um, uh, in this study, like 26 million data points uh, across Norbotten. And the analysis questions we were asking uh, is actually, can we, can we somehow quantify or see some correlation with the rurality somehow that we can, can concretely um, have a tool basically to, or, or some, some, some quantification of, of how this, uh, how this uh, cellular deprivation is actually related to the, to the rurality in the urban. Uh, rather than just qualitatively and, and uh, anecdotically depend on, 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 on um, have, uh, proofs or, or, or motivation. So here, these are all the points, and obviously these these points were because of the they were that they were put in in in, in buses and so on. They were naturally these measurements were made along roads. So this is only one one side of it. it, it there is some limitations to these to the data set. We would preferably also have had um, measurements of the type that we heard earlier from Harry in, uh, that we were really off off road. Um, but these these measurements only only refer to the uh, to the coverage on on roads. Uh, but already there we can make some kind of conclusions. So. We classified. Let's start. We classified basically all the all the residents to, as a start uh, to where they live and whether they live in large communities with uh, with with a lot of people or whether they live uh, in smaller communities as a second group or and all the rest. Really, the scattered uh, the scattered uh, people who who live who live uh, uh, not really clustered in in larger clusters. And we looked at the 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 distribution of the signal strength, which is what we measured. We measured signal strength for these networks. And, um, and uh, we measured, we looked at the distribution for these three groups of people. So this is the first group of people. These are the people in the cities. Uh, these were all the people that live in populated spots um, where at least of at least 200, uh, 200 inhabitants in a cluster. And uh, this is the distribution, the cumulative distribution of the signal strength. It means that 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 eighty percent of the people, if you look on the, on the y-axis, eighty percent of the people have at least minus seventy dBm of signal strength uh, at uh, where they live. And um, this is in the cities. So there are some people, even in cities, that have a relatively low signal strength. But typically, this is this is uh, and this is for two operators. So you can easily you can easily see. That there are also a difference between operators. Like one operator has has uh, has uh, let's say on average or typically four four decibels uh, better signal strength uh, across the across the uh, the region. The second group, and you already see it when I move here. The second group is for smaller communities, right? This is communities where people live between fifty and two hundred people together, and um, and the the signal strength in on average moves moved to the left and got got smaller. And then for the rest, for the third group of people, uh, we move even more to the left. Um, so the average signal strength of, among these people become even smaller. So you can put all those curves in one plot. And you see in essentially that typically, if you, if you compare the urban residents with the rural residents, that rural residents on average have a 12 dB uh, less coverage where they live, right? Uh, so this is already some kind of a, uh, of a, of a quantitative, uh, let's say assessment of, uh, well, rural deprivation and, and the fact that, that the quality of the network is actually um, provable, documentable, uh, documentably um, uh, worse, right? So, <clears throat> so that is, that, that is, and, and I refer to the paper if you want to see to see some other some some more figures. This is for one particular network, I don't or or generation. I don't even recall which one. But this this uh, this this structure goes along all the all the uh, the networks. And there is apparently, as you, as I said, there is also differences among operators, of course. Um, 
Uh, we also made a similar or, or an analysis then across across one particular road, right? So from uh, one of the larger roads, still a, a, a 350 kilometer road from Lulio to Kirina, we looked at the uh, at the uh, the signal strength of all the of all the um, of all the um, networks. Uh, <coughs> And you see in the top, this is the signal strength that we measured, right, a lot across this road. And you see how the how the how the and this is what you experience as a user, right? And uh, and uh, we would like to compare this, for instance, to a similarly long road in the south of Sweden, for instance, be, uh, between Stockholm and, and, and Gothenburg or whatever, and see. We haven't come to that to that. Uh, we we don't have data available for the, for those, things. but. Um, but you see how how you would experience um, the, the the change of the, the generations right in the, in the middle figure LTE at some spots you you would be fall back to the 3G and in other spots you would even have just a GSM connection and there are at some instances even across this road you will lose connection typically right here after 50 kilometers and 150 kilometers and uh, here's also a spot after 280 kilometers. Um, so, so this is this is somehow um, visualizing or quantifying what we what we experience when we when we um, when we drive here. Uh, and then moving on, this is measurement based, but we want to, we were somehow thinking also about uh, about uh, is there any um, ways to quantify this digital divide so more with with, with like. An, an, an index in particular, and we made a small. We were inspired a little bit by by uh, by results in economy because inequality measures they have been studied in economy in economics for for hundred years. Um, um, how how um, and and there there are very good tools to in economy to measure how, for instance, the uh, the, the the capital or the income. In a region or a country is actually distributed over the population among among all the people, and uh, there is there is uh, very strong indices uh, available in economics that allow us to compare countries, and uh, we 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 are used uh, to compare countries in terms of uh, distribution and how of wealth am among people, and the idea is to move to to somehow. Uh, could we could we assess could we assign a um, an index value to Norrbotten, for instance, how to how well or how bad um, uh, cellular coverage is distributed over the citizens of the region, and to somehow capture that in one single index? And if we can do that, we can compare different regions, and it could be potentially used to. Um, to uh, to as a regulatory tool, right? Um, um, I'll, I'll come to that later. So the idea is in economics to the left, you have something on the on one hand on, on the y-axis. Typically, you measure the the, the gross uh, domestic products of a country. That is typically uh, that is one way of, of of measuring wealth. But then economics also has this this concept or this notion of a Gini index. Well, that's exactly the index I, I meant on the on the x-axis. That is somehow a measure for how this wealth, this total wealth in a country, is distributed. And uh, you can it can that can either be more equal or it, uh, more e equal across all the people, or it can more, more be more unequal. And you can have this scattered plot of countries and compare them in in, in, in both of these dimensions. And that, the idea is then that. Can we transfer that to uh, on the right hand side to a similar plot for cellular coverage right on the y axis you would have the aerial coverage that's typically what gp G, the, the the regulator measures today and and, and they, they they say okay like uh, x percent of the whole swedish area is covered and that's and that's good right uh, how much how much how how large a percentage of sweden is, is actually covered but it doesn't say anything about the uh, the uh, equality or the inequality so that's what we want to have on the on the on the y on the x-axis here and in an inequality index for for uh, for cellular uh, coverage so we borrowed from the uh, from the economists the, this genie index and uh, 
typically we 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 um without going into the detail it's it's about you, you plot basically you you plot the distribution of of uh, cellular in cellular income across across a curve and if if a the distribution of the cellular the cellular um um, um, um uh, coverage would be completely independent of the uh, rurality you would get the the equal the line the 45 degree line right but if there is some un inequality if if um, if people in rurality have less are less likely to have coverage than in the urban then you would get the curve that is like this convex curve this lorentz curve that is uh, it's it's different from the from the line of equality and hence in economics they, this this gini index says okay the area a is actually a measure of in between these two lines the the perfect equality and this the actual lorentz curve that we that we get for a certain region that area A is uh, is a measure of inequality, um, <clears throat> and and we normalize that A with respect to the total area of this whole triangle. So we get always a number between zero and one. So if the number is zero, if this area A is zero, we have the perfectly equal society, right? There is no um, uh, there is no difference among among uh, in in chances. Uh, you may not have a good coverage overall in total. You may not be so a wealthy country in terms of total total coverage, but at least it's equally distributed, right? So there's a similar likelihood if you live in the rural or if you live in the urban that you actually with or without coverage. Uh, and in the opposite, if this if, if it's very unequal, this Lorentz curve is extremely convex and it, it it moves more to the to the the lower right corner, and this area A becomes really large. And this Gini index will be one, right? So a low Gini index is a, is a measure for uh, for for it's it's desirable, right? It's a, it's e a, a, an equal equality. So we did this. We took uh, we took the, the 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 coverage maps from PTS and uh, and we uh, they are uh, available for this is the aggregate coverage for 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 thirty megabits per second in two thousand eighteen. And you have them to the left, you have them for 10 megabits per second. And for the right, you have 30 megabits per second. And we, co oops, and we compare that with the population uh, on the right hand side and uh, how rural a certain, a certain region is. Um, so this is the, uh, this, this, these results are about to be published also. It's submitted to a, to a, to a journal. So I hope that this, these maps will, will uh, soon be available for, for for um, everyone to read also. Um, so we, there, we started with a measure of rurality, depending on where you live, where, where uh, there are measures for this. So this is we, something we borrowed. So these, these maps really uh, need to be somehow um, put together in, this, in such a, an, an index, right? <clears throat> so we plotted, we plot, I will skip here, we plotted those curves here. So on the right hand figure here for Norrbotten, we have the we have these curves that I just showed, similar to economics. We have a, a, a dashed a, a dotted curve here that gives complete fairness. And we have uh, depending on what technology you look at for 10 megabits per second or for 30 megabits per second, we have these curves and the area in between this, this uh, diagonal and each of the curves. It's an index. It's then an index for how equal this this uh, this um, technology this this network provides the coverage across the uh, across the Norrbotten in this case. So, for instance, this in this area uh, provides the, the the equality index, if you want, uh, for Norrbotten for this for this uh, technology. So. You could you, now we can make this scatter plot, right? Similar to the uh, similar to the the plots that we showed for economics, and we can do it throughout time. So this is the plot for whole Sweden. So this is uh, in two thousand and the left the left the in the left the red the red curve is for the thirty megabits per second, and the right curve is for ten megabits per second. So on one axis we have this. Let's say the GDP, right? The the total wealth of the nation, uh, the the percentage. This is the classical 
the classical aerial coverage. It's uh, it can be between nothing in Sweden is covered or hundred percent in Sweden of, of of the area of the air of Swedish Swedish soil is covered with 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 connectivity. But then on this axis we have this index, the new index, and um, like I said, if it's one, it's bad, right? One means all the connectivity is gathered in the cities and nothing in the rurality. Zero is desirable. And that is where it's basically there is no there's no distinction whether you live in rurality or in 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 uh, in the city. Uh, you are equally likely to have coverage or not. It's it, there is just no correlation. Right. So when when networks are starting like LTE it started or it started already earlier but in 2013 there was very little coverage right uh, aerial wise just a few percent and on top of that but so the the the, the genie the, or this the CCI index is also bad and it's typically when you roll out networks the first the first tower you build you don't put it on uh, Kepnekaise you put it on uh, in 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 the center of Stockholm which makes the index extremely bad in the beginning. But preferably, once the network is then rolled out, you want quickly, you want to move lower, right? You want to move uh, from a societal perspective. Um, the, 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 the regulator would like operators to have a low uh, CCI index, coverage index. And you see also for, for, the, for LTE 10 megabits per second, this, it is actually going down in time, but even now it's going up again. So what's even though the though the the, the coverage becomes better here, uh, that this is going up again, and the equality seems to be becoming worse. Anyway, so this is uh, I refer to this paper here in the bottom for uh, whenever it it gets published um, to um, to look at. So so bridging the divide divide. What we need to do is if if technology in any case is something we need to do, we must have technologies. And, and that favor the rural. We must do something in technology that does a better job in the rural than it does in the cities. Only then will this index uh, be, be, be better, become better. And uh, so, so uh, well, I, these, these are some examples of technologies. High towers are, are such a technology. You, you don't have any, you don't have any, um, gain of high towers in, 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 in Stockholm where you have a lot of, of base stations already but it will do a lot of a, a lot of good work in, in rural regions. So <clears throat> as a last slide and a takeaway the question is will 5G 5G bridge the digital divide? Well the question is not good. It's it, the question as such is 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 bad um, because it's not really a technology problem and it's equally much a problem in 4G as it is as it will be in 6G. And it has to do with uh, with the business models. So then we have this new equal inequality index <coughs> for cellular coverage um, that may be a measure for this. And the last takeaway would be that solutions really need, if you want to reduce this in, in, inequality, you must have some solutions in whatever that do a better job in the rural than they do in the urban. So. Um, that concludes my, my presentation. Good, okay. Um, so if there's, I don't see any questions in the, in the Q and A. Um, to answer. If there are any questions, you can, you can put them there. There was something in the chat. In the chat, okay, I'll have a look. I don't have the chat here now, yes. So, so there is an argument that it is a technology problem in a sense, because we need to start to consider bands at lower spectrum. Yeah, that's, that's obviously, a, a, that's a good point. So, so lower spectrum obviously has a larger reach similar to the large towers that i showed the higher you put the antennas the larger you reach and that is a technology that re that benefits uh, that benefits um, uh, the rural 
clearly more than the than the urban. Um, unless operators, whenever, when when as soon as they get that low spectrum, only start to using it in the cities. And there is a potential that operators may do that because it doesn't still doesn't give a good business if they if they start to use those in the in the rural. But there is this uh, there is these local licenses where operators can where rural operators, for instance, can only deploy networks in in the rural with these frequencies. So um, there's a that's a, a big thing of itself, I guess. A big question of itself: how to how to deal with spectrum licensing and not having them nationwide as we have done for thirty years. So that's that's a, that's a good point. That's a really good point. I have one question. Do, in the Sweden, do you have have discussions about how to manage emergency calls along along road? Is if if it, if the situation is so as you saw that four G coverage is very bad. Yeah. <clears throat> so. So there is this in, in one of the first slides I show these national targets and uh, it's it, unfortunately it's very vague, but the, the regulator says that by <clears throat> by 2023. All places in Sweden where and now I'm I'm, I'm I'm quoting where people reside and move those places must be must have coverage. And now it's up to the reg. That's by law then, or by by an, 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 a governmental uh, like target. And then it's up to the regulator to somehow to somehow enforce this. And that's really the problem. How the Swedish regulator is going to to tell operators and to 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 execute that dec governmental decision? But um, there is uh, it is there should there should be coverage along the roads. Yes, yes. And hopefully in the upcoming targets by the governments, this will be much more, let's say, concrete and much more like quantifiable, like I said. That's what we need. We need to, quant to quantify this. Then we can manage and steer and follow up. Okay, <clears throat> time is, it's 11 o'clock. So um, I think this, we, we come to the end of this, uh, of this um, webinar. And uh, we have heard four very nice presentations, I think, from, from Oulu and, and, and from Lulio, uh, from Ericsson. So uh, I want to thank the, the, um, the other uh, presenters, obviously, and uh, all in the audience. And we will make this, uh, the slides available, and we will make uh, recordings available. Um, in the coming days, and we will we we have your registration, so you will be noticed notified about that. All right, uh, thanks a lot, and perhaps uh, we re this will be repeat re repeated in twenty twenty two. Bye bye. Okay, thank you. Bye bye.